Welcome to a new video. Today I want to have a look at compressor maps because I have seen a lot of people explain them in the past, uh, but uh, for my taste they have been kind of overcomplicated and I want to teach you how to read them and interpret them the easy way. We have to start off of we have two compressor maps uh, right here one is from a garrett gbc 2300 and one is from a g35 1050 as you can see up here the reason why i chose garrett turbos is because they have any every compressor map for their turbos available and they are very detailed so it's the easiest to get off of not everybody has compressor maps for their turbos for example uh, if you are going to use a hybrid turbo usually there are not any compressor maps available like for if you use the upgraded turbo uh, then the chance that there are compressor maps is relatively low but you might be able to find some still but that's the reason why I have chosen this. There's also something to point out. Is this really, or does this really make sense for you analyzing a compressor map? Um, that depends on basically your situation. If you are just road tuning and not going on a dyno and not measuring the uh, power of your car, uh, be it on a dyno or be it for example with a virtual dyno uh, where you can approximate the power of your car um, then that doesn't make much sense um, another way would be using the mass airflow sensor of a stock car to approximate power because you can use the flow of air that is taken in by the mass airflow sensor as a metric right here the first thing i want to look at are the axes you can see here we have these two so we have pressure ratio which is not boost pressure but something else i'm going to explain shortly and we have the airflow this is in two different metrics we have pounds per minute and kilograms per second although i live in a country where the uh, units of measurement are metric um, using pounds per minute makes a lot of sense because uh, in theory you can times this by time this by 10 and you will have a rough horsepower number uh, somewhere between at the crank or at the wheels depending on what setup you have but that's a rough estimate for example if you would run 500 horsepower you would land at about 50 pounds per minute and that's what you also can see here the 35 1050 is able to uh, at max achieve about a thousand horsepower while the uh, gbc 2300 will be able to achieve about 280 horsepower okay so we have the airflow axis explained now it's basically the power your car makes and then you can see where you are in the table with the pressure ratio the pressure ratio is as i said not the boost pressure we are starting off from one which means one would be in a normal application would be atmospheric or it would be the air before it enters the turbo not in your air box not anywhere outside it is right before it enters the turbo what the turbo has to take in so for example one bar or 100 kpa when it's atmospheric at sea level or if you are very high up, like at a very high altitude, then it might even just be 0.9 bar or 90 kPa. And there's also a factor. If, for example, your intake is very restrictive, then that pressure ratio falls down even more. So you would get you your pressure ratio would be at, for example, 0.8, or rather, your pressure you are starting at would be at 0.8 bar and your pressure ratio so this is what basically your pressure that you are taking in air from is timed by that axis so for example at 0.9 bar or at 0.8 bar of intake pressure at a two times pressure ratio that would only be a boost level of 0.8 bar and at three times pressure ratio that would only be 
you guessed it, 1.6 bar and not 2 bar like it would be if your intake pressure would be at 1 bar. I hope that's kind of clear. So this always depends on or how well the intake system is working or what your altitude is. Of course, this also can go the other way around, for example, on compound turbos, which is a lot more complicated, so I'm going to not go into much detail on here. But for example, on compound turbos, there you can start off of a much higher pressure. And for example, if the turbo you are boosting into would already see one bar of boost, then your pressure ratio from one to two would be if you would be saying one bar, there would be already two bar here. And at three, three bar. So now that we have the intake pressure from the turbo, we also have to take a look at what pressure that actually or actually is meant by this. Because the pressure that you are seeing at your intake manifold that goes into your engine is not necessarily, and in most cases, not even the pressure that goes out of the turbo because through an intercooler you will have some pressure drop while on a good quality intercooler it might not be much only like 0.05 or 0.1 bar um, this can get higher the higher your boost pressure is so if you for example would start at 0.9 bar or 90 kpa of boost pressure and you're seeing 1.5 bar of manifold absolute pressure, but your intercooler produces a drop of 0.2 bar. So in theory, you are seeing 1.7 bar directly after the compressor wheel. So you would land almost at the three times pressure ratio, although you are not running close to two bar and this is where this gets important because now you can judge in what efficiency range your compressor or your turbo is actually running it and if you have room to up the boost some more and make some more power or if you don't so for example let's take our g35 1050 and our example you're running 1.5 bar um, manifold absolute pressure so basically the boost that gets into your engine as an example Andrew we are just taking a 2JZ here for example because it's a very popular engine and um, the power numbers those engines make at that power level are pretty common knowledge that would be around 600 horsepower so you would be ending up around here that is in probably one of the, if not the most efficient area the turbo is operating at. This can be seen by the percentage values here. These percentage values is how efficient the turbo operates in this range. So how much heat it is producing, how much power it is producing per boost level or per PSI of boost and how well it is working. We also have these numbers right here. This is the RPM values of the compressor or rather of the turbo itself. And as you can see here, we would be at about 105,000 and the maximum is 130,000. While you can go slightly above that, it isn't really recommended and at a lot above that, the turbo will take damage and uh, yeah, that's not a great time. So for example, we would be looking at like 78% here and we'll, you would be able to push it quite a bit more. If we, for example, would want to make one bar more of boost pressure, that would kick us about to here. So four times the pressure ratio, that's almost out of the range of the turbo. So that would be about 2.5 bar of map pressure so that's quite a lot for this engine and we would probably be running out of turbo because we cannot with this setup run a lot uh, run this kind of power we would be able to at max run about 
800 to maybe 850 horsepower. This would show itself in a phenomenon that you would add boost pressure but the turbo wouldn't or the engine wouldn't make any more power and because that is because you are just running out of turbo. You are telling the turbo yeah try and make 2.6, 2.8 or 3 bar even and the turbo will just not make any more power and that's where the power line is. So uh, that's what I am going to go into next. but. This is one of the factors or how you can tell that you are basically out of turbo, for example. To get more out of this compressor, you would have to choose a bigger one, which would have a more extended map back to here. So you would have the possibility of running higher power levels. And that's why you can see while the G35 1050 is advertised as a 1000 horsepower turbo, you will not necessarily reach that with that turbo. Even if we, for example, ran at 3.5x, which would be in our case about 2 bar plus or minus, we even would here not end up at 1000, we would only end up at like 930 horsepower and that's probably where most of these setups are going to land if this, this turbo was used. Of course, this depends heavily on the exhaust side and on the other components of the engine, but this is what this compressor would be able to achieve. On the other hand though, like for example this here, this line on the other end of where you wouldn't basically run out of turbo, but where you would be at the lower limit, that is the surge line. As an example. If, for example, at low RPM, your turbo will spool very early and will you are achieving at 3000 horsepower at 3000 RPM about 300 horsepower, but you are already making like or trying to make at least two bar of boost. So you would be wanting to go here, but the surge line is down here. And that's where you would hear turbo surge. That is really bad for the turbo and the bearings and basically everything and is a killer of turbos because that engine would just not be able to uh, utilize that amount of pressure or that amount of airflow the turbo actually produces and therefore you wouldn't be, you would be getting surge here. And that is what this line is. For example, in a worst case application, you could run this like at 2.5 bar an hour situation. And uh, if you would run at 2.5 bar and the engine would make like 500 horsepower, but that's pretty unrealistic for this size of turbo. There is, would be something wrong if you were, for example, at that, uh, at that value or at these values. In an ideal scenario, you want to ride that surge line. So do not go under it so that your turbo experiences surge, but ride that surge line and then go to basically the, if you hold the boost, you want to basically go to through the efficiency band to the maximum of the turbo that it can handle and that would be the ideal scenario to get the maximum out of your turbo. Of course, this isn't possible like every time, but mm, it's the you can judge how that is done by looking at logs, looking at what the engine makes on the dyno as for power, or even on a stock ECU car, what it makes on a, what the logs show with your mass airflow sensor. And that's why mass airflow sensors can be so important and can be such a good value or such an, such an amazing tool for tuning actually. Looking at the smaller size turbo, we obviously have the same values here, though the turbo can run with a higher RPM. And our efficiency is at a lower power level in general. So for example, with this GBC 2300, we are even at 150 horsepower and at a relatively left point of the efficiency range or the 
range where the turbo can operate we are already pretty efficient and we are this is not really a turbo that wants to achieve max power it is more like a mid-range turbo which makes sense due to it being very responsive and it is also able to handle uh, high boost pressures under lower load a lot better as you can see here the curve for the surge line is much wider than it is on the g35 for example but the efficiency on the right side here for example it drops off to 60 percent here so it is not that efficient if you go like above 250 horsepower this is probably an ideal turbo for about 230 to 250 horsepower i'd say because that's exactly where the efficiency islands like that's what the these high efficiency values are called where these land and you want to be at that so that you don't create excessive heat and your turbo runs efficient as efficiently as possible or at least the compressor does what the turbine side is doing that's a whole different story but there are a lot of factors that compound this effect on the turbine side i want to get into this as well but there's a lot more things to look out for be it manifolds be it uh, ar size so the size of the exhaust housing the turbine wheels actually the exhaust manifold diameter the flange size if it is twin scroll or not there's a lot that affects this and that's not as simple in quotations as the compressor map for example that's it from me i hope you understood what i was going for and otherwise i wish you a nice day and goodbye